Hello, and it is a pleasure to welcome all of you to this online webinar on promoting active participation of women in the judiciary held on the occasion of today's International Day of Women Judges. This event is organized by the Global Judicial Integrity Network of UNODC in collaboration with some of our good partners, namely the International Bar Association, the UNDP Judicial Integrity Network in ASEAN, the Institute for African Women in Law, the Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights of OSCE, and the International Association of Women Judges. My name is Tatiana Veresh, and I work as Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice Officer at UNODC, where I coordinate the activities of the Global Judicial Integrity Network. The network and today's International Day of Women Judges are closely linked, not only because the network is a global network of judges, including women judges, but also because our gender related work, in fact, inspired the, the establishment of the International Day. And it is also explicitly appreciated by the General Assembly resolution that adopted this International Day. Today's event will last about 75 minutes and will consist of two parts. The first one will feature senior female judges from different parts of the world who have kindly agreed to share their experiences and views on how to promote gender equality and active participation of women in the judiciary. And the second part will give space to our partner organizations to tell you more about their relevant work so that you might leave this webinar equipped with some concrete ideas on how to learn more about the topic and how to actively get involved in the ongoing initiatives. As you might have noticed, for the quality of today's uh, the webinar, your cameras and microphones have been disabled, but you are very welcome to use the chat function to introduce yourself, to say hi to other participants and share relevant information. So without further ado, I'm very pleased that for the opening remarks, uh, today we have here with us Judge Vanessa Ruiz, who is one of the members of the Global Judicial Integrity Network's advisory board and who also played an important role in the establishment of the International Day of Women Judges. Judge Ruiz is a senior judge on the District Court, District of Columbia Court of Appeals, the highest court of the District of Columbia in the United States. Being a champion on gender equality, Judge Ruiz is also the immediate past president of the International Association of Women Judges and former president of the U.S. National Association of Women Judges. Judge Ruiz, thank you so much for, for being here with us today, and I would like to hand over to you for your opening remarks. Thank you, Tatiana. Uh, on this March 10th International Day of Women Judges, we are reminded that the rule of law advances peace and counters the rule of might, which is self-serving and does not recognize the rights of others. The rule of law depends on an independent judiciary that has the respect and the confidence of the society it serves. Women judges are necessary to an independent judiciary that acts with competence and integrity and earns the public trust, trust. The International Day of Women Judges recognizes the leadership of women judges in promoting the rule of law and equally important, human rights. To provide, it provides a focal point to educate the public about the essential role of women in society and serves as an inspiration to girls and young women who aspire to contribute their talents and energy to their countries and to the international community. It also challenges governments around the world to identify where there are obstacles to the inclusion and the advancement of women judges at all levels, including the highest courts and policy-making bodies of the judiciary. 
This is a mission not only for women, but for all who are committed to the rule of law, human rights, and the peaceful resolution of disputes. Mostly today is a day for celebration and for recognition. I want to recognize the women judges around the world who endeavor on a daily basis to uphold the rule of law in very difficult circumstances. There are judges in war-torn countries, judges who resist political pressures and who work in countries that are ravaged by natural disasters. There are judges in countries where the role of women judges and the independence of the judiciary are not properly recognized. And in this respect, I want to mention in particular the women judges of Afghanistan, some of which are still trapped under Taliban rule with no respect for their rights and who have been stripped completely of their judicial roles. This day offers us an opportunity also to reflect on the past achievements of women judges, but also challenge us to see how much farther we need to go to achieve our goals of upholding the rule of law, promoting gender equality, and ensuring access to justice for all. It also gives us an opportunity to stress to the world the importance of international organizations and efforts and organizations like the IBA, the International Association of Women Judges and its affiliated associations around the, around the world and of efforts like the Global Judicial Integrity Network. It is highly significant that the importance of women judges in achieving gender equality has been recognized by the UN when the General Assembly adopted overwhelmingly the resolution designating this day as the International Day of Women Judges. It also it is also significant, as Tatiana mentioned at the outset, that the initiative, the impetus for the adoption of the International Day of Women Judges, grew out of a consensus at the at a meeting of the Global Judicial Integrity Network, a high level meeting attended by a top member to the judiciary from many, many countries. And that is because the values of inclusiveness, of commitment to equality and human rights are critical to the integrity of the judiciary. We usually think of integrity in terms of uh, ridding the judiciary of corruption and bias, and those are certainly important aspects. But there are affirmative values, values of inclusion, of commitment to human rights that are equally important. And in this regard, the role of women in the judiciary is essential. As we recognize today and we celebrate women judges, we celebrate this re international recognition of the hard work, of the sacrifices, and the invaluable contributions made by women judges around the globe. Now that we have this day to show our appreciation and to celebrate and to challenge ourselves, I welcome all of you to reflect on the comments by the two panels that are following, as I am sure that they will add significantly to our appreciation of why it is that we have an International Day of Women Judges. Thank you. Thank you so much, Judge Reese, for your insightful remarks and for all your valuable contributions to the Global Judicial Integrity Network and beyond. For the first part of this webinar, I am so pleased to welcome our experienced and highly distinguished panelists, four women judges from four different regions uh, of the world. And I am delighted to welcome Honorable Roxanne George, the Chief Justice of Guyana, 
She has rich professional experiences as a judge and also previously served as acting, direct, acting director of public prosecutions of Guyana. Chief Justice George has been very active on the topic of gender issues in the judiciary, including and as part of her membership in various associations of judges and lawyers. Honorable Shirani Tilakawardane, former Justice of the Supreme Court of Sri Lanka, will be our second panelist. She is a consultant to Sri Lanka's Judges Institute, an international judicial educator, and a national and international arbitrator. Justice Tilaka Vardane is also an active advocate for gender equality and member of several relevant international advisory boards. Our next speaker will be Honorable Adisa Zahiragic, judge of the Cantonal Court in Sarajevo, Bosnia and Herzegovina. And she is a former president of 11 years of the Association of Women Judges in Bosnia and Herzegovina. She's also an educator in the fields of gender equality and human rights and published numerous papers on the topic. And our last speaker will be Honorable Ifeinva Nasaya Okoye, a senior magistrate with the Anambra State Judiciary in Nigeria. She previously served as a president of the customary court sitting in Ajali, Anambra State. In 2019, she was sworn in as the first person with a physical disability into the Enembra State Judiciary. So I would like to now turn to our first panelist, Honorable Roxanne George, the Chief Justice of Guyana, and ask as a starting question the following. Women generally remain underrepresented in senior leadership and managerial positions in many judiciaries of the world. In your view, how can countries promote advancement of women in judicial systems and institutions at the senior levels? And what strategies and measures might be helpful in this regard? Thank you very much, Tatiana. Good morning, good day, good evening to wherever you are in the world. I thank the Global Judicial Integrity Network for inviting me to participate in this webinar. And I extend best wishes to my sister judges on the panel and to all women judges joining us and throughout the world as we celebrate International Day of Women Judges. In answer to this question, I must say that the history of women in judicial office in the Caribbean is a very positive one. In this regard, I must pay tribute to Justice Desiree Bernard, retired judge of the Caribbean Court of Justice, and retired Chancellor of the Judiciary of Guyana, my home country. I pay tribute to Justice Zela Makala, retired Chief Justice of Jamaica, to Justice Maureen Rajnaut Lee, Judge of the Caribbean Court of Justice, and the many, many pioneering women judicial officers who paved the way so that now there are many women judges in the Caribbean. Currently, women are heads of judiciary in Guyana, in the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court, the Turks and Caicos Islands, Belize, and the Cayman Islands. Overall, there's a very high percentage of women judges in the region, over 50% in most territories, with 60% and over in some of them. And in Guyana, the entire leadership of our judiciary, the chancellor who is head of the, judi of the judiciary, the chief justice, chief magistrate, registrar, and deputy registrar are women and 70% of all our judicial officers are women. We have developed a number of strategies for the development of our judiciaries in the region. The Caribbean Association of Judicial Officers, the Caribbean Association of Women Judges, and its affiliates in Jamaica and Guyana, with others in the process of being formed, all formally and informally provide for a system of mentorship by education and training through these organizations and the judicial education institutes and programs throughout the region, we seek to ensure that judicial officers are equipped to dispense both procedural and substantive justice. In this regard, adherence to judicial codes of ethics is emphasized, both directly and indirectly. The programming and the programs train judicial officers in leadership. Having so many women as role models has possibly 
lent to the large number of women studying law and graduating from the regional law schools. Our law schools are relatively young when compared to other countries, for example, in Latin America. We are celebrating 50 years of regional legal education and with it, the thousands of lawyers who have graduated, many of whom have become judges and heads of judiciary in the region, with others serving on international courts and tribunals. As we all know, court staff are an integral part of ensuring that the rule of law and access to justice are promoted. Many of our administrative staff, including at managerial levels, are women. Training of staff is also conducted through our judicial education institutes and programs, which include building capacity to lead and to function in leadership positions. We in the Caribbean are proud of our track record of having judiciaries of integrity, judiciaries that are inclusive of women at all levels, including in positions of leadership. And going forward, we will aim to maintain this high level of inclusion of women in our judiciaries. So to answer the question, Tatiana, it is a very positive answer from the Caribbean. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Justice George. Thank you for highlighting your positive experience as well as some of the strategies, including mentorship, education, training. These are all really important aspects. Uh, and the second question, why is equal gender representation in the judiciary so important in terms of access to justice, integrity of the judiciary, diversity of, of the judiciary or, or other areas? Thank you again. Ensuring gender equality in judiciaries, indeed in all spheres, not only speaks to inclusivity, but to ensuring that the voices of the voiceless and vulnerable are heard. What we as women judges have brought to the administration of justice over the years as evidence in our contributions to the justice sector and in the management of courts and as evidenced in our judgments is an understanding of gendered issues. For example, ensuring that women's unpaid caring work for their families is taken into consideration in cases involving division of property, maintenance, and family members and family matters. Caribbean women judges have addressed these issues. They have also been at the forefront of promoting gender sensitive adjudication, for example, in sexual offenses and trafficking in persons cases. Taking the lead in training and sensitization sessions for stakeholders and the public alike. We continue to seek ways to tackle the pervasive scourge of domestic or intimate partner violence, as well as violence in our communities. Additionally, through the collaboration of the Caribbean Court of Justice and UN Women, work has begun on the rollout of harassment policies and training for regional judiciaries. Whilst ensuring that we maintain the integrity of the judicial system, we must see ourselves as continual change agents committed to significantly reducing, if not eliminating bias and discrimination, so as to ensure gender equality and respect for the rights of all, especially women and girls. Our courts must be seen to be inclusive, serving all who come through our doors. And in these times, all who appear before us virtually, whatever their circumstances. We must endeavor to promote what I would describe as the justice circle. We must foster trust and confidence in the administration of justice. And by espousing inclusivity, we will thereby promote access to justice and in turn foster trust and confidence in the system. If we hold fast to these goals and values, court customers and potential court customers, particularly women, who are often under-resourced and fearful or intimidated by the system or by others, for example, their partners, they will be encouraged to access justice. They must see our court places as spaces where they will encounter not only substantive justice, but procedural justice, where they will be both seen and heard. It is our duty, where relevant, continue to continuously ask the women questions. 
what is it that will ensure justice for women? What is it that will ensure that women's rights are truly recognized as human rights? In our roles as judicial officers, we must constantly remind ourselves, our colleagues, court staff, and stakeholders, that we must remain committed to promoting inclusivity and access to justice for all, including seeking to justly answer the woman question. Thank you, Tatiana. Thank you very much, Chief Justice George, for sharing these really important points, including the importance of being the continual change agents in order to achieve truly gender equality in the judiciary and for the court users. I would now like to turn to our second panelist, Justice Tila Kawardane from, from Sri Lanka. You come from a different country, a different region. What are your experiences and, and views on the importance of women's representation in the judiciary? And from your experience, how can we practically promote the advancement of women in judicial systems? Judge Dila Kawardane, over to you. Judge Tila Kawardane, can you hear us? Can you hear me now? We can hear you now and okay. also see you. <laughs> Wonderful. Right. The floor is yours. Yeah. Good evening and thank you UNODC and Tatiana and Thomas for organizing this virtual platform this year in the midst of celebration of International Women's Day 2023 under the theme of Tech All. We today celebrate the day set apart in recognition of us women judges. The strength of the judiciary in any country is in its ability to evolve embracing diversity and inclusivity with representation. This very evolution enables the implementation of the power of the rule of law to be transformative and deliver justice with empathy and sensitivity to substantive equality. This in turn facilitates and become a tool for the courts to be empathetic to the real time issues faced by society. The challenge for all of us is that gender identities and archaic gender myths and stereotypes reflect the true hierarchical relationship between men and women and are anchored to gender identities that are built on social constructs. This is the theme, the pattern, and the dilemma of South Asia and in most Asian countries, and I'm sure you, has a reflection or a little thread of it that runs through the globe. The concomitant unequal power distribution and rights mostly favoring men are thereby being perpetuated. This unequal power distribution, usually embedded in the deep shadows of patriarchy and toxic masculinities, is sadly, sadly supported by cultural tradition and beliefs and religions. This also forms an insulation, regressing the development of the law to reflect substantive equality. We need to redefine many fundamentals, make changes to reflect our contribution as women to the system, where still there is the yardstick of the reasonable man standard. When or when will we have at least a reasonable person standard? Do we need to redefine masculinity, masculinities to enhance the power of women's lens and overcome the toxic masculinity of patriarchal systems that disempowers women from reaching their complete dignity and respect and autonomy with full enjoyment of their equal guarantees and freedoms? I do not tell you how important it is to have female judges but I need to tell you that we need to have them in sustainable numbers with continued emphat emphatically focused 
gender sensitization and equality and human rights education at all the levels of the judiciary. We know how a gender balanced judiciary assists in understanding and reflecting the realities of society and how women judges often approach problems with an empathetic lens and inherently navigate the law with modern, con modern concepts of emotional intelligence. To achieve substantive equality at its best, the process of the delivery of justice in the judicial system around the world must be encouraged to develop new ways. Guidelines like the Bangkok Gender Bank Guidelines for Judges and or mandated SOPs or standard operating procedures to assist all the judicial officers to meet out justice upon being confronted with an issue which demands gender sensitization is the exercise of justice in the sorry in the exercise of justice. Uh, this is really important because however much you train judges on gender stereotypes, you have workshops, you have all kinds of guidelines that we have built over the last several years, yet in implementation, because it is con controlled by a hierarchy of male judges in most instances, or non-sensitized female judges, you find that it is difficult to implement. And unless we have this embedded as standard operating procedures, it's going to be very slow progress. All judges should be taught how to follow these guidelines, SOPs which should assist the judges in all vulnerable victim cases, travels on the best path afforded, which whilst enabling justice would also address the protection of equalities and move away from the stereotypes and myths which are unconsciously embedded and renders implicit and explicit bias. This should be for all judges and include court staff and the prosecuting officers and indeed the entire administration of justice stakeholders. And in my view, be formulated under the objective and core values of the Bangalore principles, which will ensure that justice meted out by courts reach all stratification of an already set stratified society. Thank you. Thank you, Justice Tilakawardane, for sharing experiences from your country and your region and for raising some important points about empathy and the need for sustainable solutions and the guidelines for, for judges and, and for the public. And one more question to you, uh, and that is that the whole world recently went through the pandemic that changed in many respects the way we communicate and work, and it has of course affected the judiciary too, and brought among others the extended use of technology. Do you perceive any particular challenges stemming from the pandemic that women judges are faced with, or any important lessons learned or good practices related to gender? Well, I, I think by the 23rd of March 2019, was it, I had to begin lectures which, with 23 brand new judges. And unlike in your country, we had a curfew. We could not step out of the homes. We had problems just getting the basics to our houses. And in the midst of it here with these 23 judges, which, which to me, also because of the time that was available, was a wonderful tool for, for getting them together and bringing other judges onto a platform. Fortunately, I'm fairly competent in, in, in um, technology and I started the lectures and I would love at some point to be able to sit down and talk with you about what I went through in a South Asian country where there was no money because the ministry was closed to teach the judges and what a rich experience it became. And they actually had um, a wonderful, because we had like three hour lectures in the morning and the e in the evening because we were all under curfew. And the virtual platforms proved a blessing. But also I really saw what inequality meant in that, even in that virtual platform, but I do not have the time to go into it, but I will talk about technology and it's what we have to be careful about. So over the last 
30 years, the field of artificial intelligence has become a pervasive force in all industries, including the legal field. As its impact becomes increasingly ubiquitous, opening a portal to new opportunities, efficiency and connectivity for lawyers, judges and litigants, AI-related data analytics has also unleashed a labyrinth of growing concerns which affect the system and rule of justice system and rules of law. The development of artificial intelligence in the legal field and its impact on both lawyers and the judiciary has to become an open narrative. We have to address the concerns that coincide with the development of this particular technology and its implementation in the course of legal proceedings and the steps taken towards a specialized focus and emergence of experts on the ethical and efficient use of artificial intelligence in law. That is paramount, that we as the judiciary cannot put our signature and cannot ratify unless it is an ethical development of artificial intelligence. Hence, it is important that AI-based systems and their coded algorithms should ensure the minimization of the bias or the formal assessment of bias. In this context, there exists an abundance of authentic data that reveals how bias manifests itself, resulting in an ever-growing gender gap in data-driven algorithms and blockchain technology with serious adverse consequences of discrimination and disempowerment, which are not just incremental, but has the trajectory to grow exponentially, resulting in concomitant adverse effects on the lives and livelihoods of women. Artificial intelligence encompasses the process of intelligent automation, such as machine learning, natural language processes, cognitive computing and deep learning, motivated by the science of organic human intelligence. The development of artificial intelligence is not to mimic, mimic biological or cognitive intelligence, but to create systems focused on performing a desired function. In 2016, a landmark decision in Britain, in in, given by the English High Court, I can give you the reference to that, approved the use of predictive coding technology in what they call e-discovery. Predictive coding also as technological assistant review, TA, is computer software that performs searches and assesses relevant electronically stored information, or ESI, in most instances using predictive coding software documents Will be, and will be, which will be disclosed only after manual, manually reviewed, which will only be disclosed only after being manually reviewed by lawyers. There are a few cases which I wish you would read about. One is called the State versus Loomis, and I will give the references to Tatiana, where technology development in the 4IR will reflect the values, including the biases, prejudices, and preconceived notions of their creator. And the important thing that this is always the creative part of tech, that technology is protected by property rights, intellectual property rights. And therefore, we often cannot scrutinize it or see the details of how it is done. This can lead to the widening, widening of the gender gap and lead to disastrous consequences causing the invisibility of women. In developing and testing new products with 4IR technology embedded, male standards tend to be used instead of female standards. This unintentional discrimination re re results in male standards being used in testing processes. Products like the artificial heart were suitable only for 20% women. And the seat belt took 30 years to consider female pregnancy, the child passenger, and the breast tissue of women, thus putting them at a great major risk. The invisibility of the fourth industrial revolution is a plethora of new opportunities, of course. While we have closed 68% of the gender gaps worked by, there still is an underrepresentation of women in the STEM fields. And I think we really need to have a judicial training of judges for the purpose directed towards the courts and effective implementation of the law. 
in, in fields like STEM, in STEM fields. Further, 4IR will affect women's jobs first, such as SEWBOTS, which is an artificial intelligence motivated um, uh, robot, which will replace up to 80% of the garment factory jobs. And that is most of the jobs in our area, South Asian regions. Researchers need to be mostly women. Female digital leaders and data scientists are invaluable for their gender sensitive outlook and uh, outlook and in output. I think here the European lawyers, who judges and the scientists played a big uh, role in exposing what was going on. Their experience with bias allows them to identify unintended gender bias and re resolutions. If not, artificial related process and products will continue to impair in disadvantage women in minority groups, women and other minority groups. At present, the over representation of men in the design stage of AI can result in dismantling the efforts to close the gender bias. Yeah. Women in technology extend to language. Even the simplest form of electronic communication, the emoji, recognize only male-centric emojis where they had, uh, when they said runner, it was a man. When they said police officer, it was a woman. And until Unicode was informed about this and they then recognized the gender implications. The revolution, evolution of mankind has always been told from a male narrative with an occasional chapter dedicated to women's contributions. As we embark on an advanced digital frontier where AI machine learning and robotics convert, it is critical and crucial that we involve women, women judges, women lawyers, and women law students as part of our ongoing history if we are to step into a digital world that benefits everyone. And I'll end by saying this is really important. Scrutiny by the judges for preventing, pre preserving the integrity of law, the constitutionality safeguards, fair trial, open justice and transparency should all, to ensure it, it all this technology should be judge-led and not technology-led. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Justice Tilakawardane. And your points on technology are also particularly relevant in view of the theme of this year's International Women's Day, which we celebrated two days ago and which focused on innovation and technology for, for gender equality. So this was very timely. Thank you. I would now like to turn to our next panelist, Judge Zahir Ragic from Bosnia and Herzegovina. Judge Zahiragic, uh, what do you see as the main challenges faced by women judges and the main obstacles to fair gender representation in your court, in your country and in your region? Over to you. Thank you, Tatiana. I am glad to be the part of this important event and thank, thank you for invitation. Uh, First of all, I want to say and emphasize that women judges have a unique position to highlight specific issues regarding gender inequality in each society. Uh, in that way, I am very glad to emphasize that in Bosnia and Herzegovina, we established Association of Women Judges uh, and we started 2009 and we are the part of international women judges. Uh, we started 2009 and it means that uh, we wanted to cover many gender issues, but we started with the special international project, Sextortion, and it is a phenomenon that explains the abuse of the position of power in extorting sex, uh, instead money, and the victims are mainly women. Uh, that phenomenon is complex and uh, uh, very uh, not, uh, not understandable. Uh, that means that when we appear with that topic, uh, we uh, could see that female judges and male judges, they don't accept that phenomenon and don't understand. Uh, that project uh, uh, covers three countries, 
um, Tanzania, Filipini, and Bosnia and Herzegovina, and it was very interesting comparing legal systems in those countries. Uh, we noticed from Bosnia and Herzegovina that we share the same issues, the same problem concerning uh, this phenomenon. Uh, we spent three years doing in that project, and we published some uh, some uh, notes and uh, some books. It was very, very important for uh, judges and prosecutors, and they can see what we were talking on in that way. Uh, after that, uh, we continued as uh, association the topics of sexual harassment, domestic violence, and sexual offenses. We analyzed uh, numerous final judgments and concluded that gender prejudice is equally present in uh, female and male judges. The criminal policy of these crimes is mild because these acts are not taken seriously. Uh, I mentioned sextortion uh, not taken seriously, but when we speak about those topics, what I mentioned, sexual har harassment, domestic violence, and uh, sexual offenses, uh, the same, not taken seriously. And that's why we continued with education. Speaking about uh, our association, uh, I can say uh, it doesn't mean uh, that we that the, the members of the, that association each female judge not that it is voluntary to be the member of this association but very important to emphasize that we covered uh, many topics uh, regarding uh, gender equality. <clears throat> uh, Speaking about uh, about uh, uh, experience from my country, uh, I can say that women uh, are in uh, ma in majority in the judiciary, uh, but women judges don't support each other. Uh, that means it doesn't help that uh, uh, female judges are in majority in our society, in our judiciary. Uh, I noticed in many examples that uh, female judges don't support each other. Uh, I noticed that uh, some ideas that come from individual female judges regarding, for example, improving the situation in judiciary are not valued and supported by women judges because they are used to obeying male authorities. I can say maybe it is connected with uh, our tradition and our habits that uh, uh, female judges and uh, uh, women at, in general in our country, uh, they, uh, they like to be the part of tradition and habits and uh, they used to obey male. Women judges try to do their job in the best way and don't, don't spare themselves. It's natural that women work harder. Prejudice and stereotypes are still strong and uh, male judges are more trusted than women and their mistakes are tolerated more. Uh, another problem, what I uh, noticed, um, even we have uh, female judges in majority, male judges are more trusted than women. It is, um, it is specific, maybe uh, similar situation is, uh, exists in the other countries around the world, but I noticed that situation in my country. Uh, also, I noticed that uh, male judges know how to organize themselves in a way delegating jobs to assistants, mostly uh, women, unlike uh, female judges who do both judicial and administrative tasks. 
Uh, that means that uh, female judges are ready to obey and uh, accept many tasks, but uh, male judges are not ready to do that. <clears throat> uh, that's why I think that situation uh, could be changed through the education and uh, we organize in our association and uh, present our ideas how to overcome uh, gender bias in judiciary because gender bias are very much connected with the judicial integrity. It is not possible to speak about judicial integrity if we didn't overcome a gender bias. Gender bias exists strongly in our society, including judiciary. Uh, uh, and so I want to, uh, to uh, uh, highlight that it's very important for uh, young uh, female judges uh, to be strong, to be open, and to be supportive for the other ju female judges. Uh, that means that uh, when you uh, reach that position, it is complex. Judge position is complex, covers many tasks. But uh, that means the same time that you have unique position to do changes in, in your society. It is a special opportunity to analyze the laws in, in, uh, in our country, in our judiciary, uh, through the cases. And you can see what is good and what is wrong. And uh, I, uh, I support uh, female judges to, to initiate some changes in the laws uh, when they notice that laws, some laws are not good for our society. Be the part of the society and to understand what is going in, in uh, uh, our country. It is very important for judge position. That's why I can say to young judges and repeat, please be supportive to the other female judges. Thank you, Judge Zahiragic, for providing us with such a comprehensive and honest overview of the experiences uh, in, in your country. You, in fact, covered uh, largely also my second question, uh, which was going to be about the recommendations to, to other women judges. And thank you so much for highlighting the point about the importance of supporting each other and the importance of, of mentorship uh, and, and mutual peer learning uh, among uh, women judges. Uh, but to give you an opportunity to, to, to elaborate a little bit further, if you would like, uh, maybe looking more at your personal experience, have there been any challenges you have encountered from which you drew some lessons uh, that could be helpful to, to other women judges? Yes, um, I can see uh, many, many benefits for uh, female judges. And I can share my experience because I'm senior judge and I'm glad to, to share my experience. And uh, I think it is very good, especially for uh, young judges. Uh, very important is uh, raising awareness of gender is issues is a long and demanding process that must be recognized in system education. Speaking about uh, system education, it is very important to emphasize uh, that kind of issue uh, because everything uh, comes from education. Uh, uh, going to school and faculties, uh, you can face with the knowledge in, in many different aspects, but I noticed that we didn't cover in the education system uh, human rights, including gender issues. And that means uh, when um, female judges, when they finish uh, law faculty and start to work um, in judiciary or in uh, attorney, 
uh, it is difficult to understand what is going on in judiciary. Uh, that's why I think um, uh, I init initiate actually uh, lately uh, to create cooperation between uh, law faculties and uh, uh, courts and, uh, and uh, uh, all prosecutors. I think it is very important to give the chance young people from the faculty, law faculty, to see how is going in judiciary, what is going on at the courts, and uh, it is uh, the chance uh, chance for them uh, to combine their theoretical education with practice at the court. Uh, also, it is very important for uh, young people uh, to, to speak with judges directly. I didn't have the chance when I studied law faculty uh, many years ago. I didn't have chance to speak directly with judges or prosecutors. It was impossible. But now uh, we have situation uh, through the cooperation with law fac faculties to come here to see uh, what kind of courts we have, what is going at the courts, and what kind of uh, cases we cover at the case. Uh, they watch uh, trials, and after uh, those trials, uh, students have opportunity uh, to ask judges uh, what they uh, concerning their impressions after the trials, and uh, they want to share some uh, law problems to share with judges. And judges, uh, mentors are ready to answer on their questions. And it's very important that we created uh, mentors at the courts and prosecutors' office and the students had the chance to be better lawyers and uh, to analyze do they want to be the part of uh, judiciary. Uh, if they make decision to be the part of uh, judiciary after law faculties, that means that they can see what values uh, of judiciary what bad and what good in judiciary? Because there are many, many things what we not satisfied as female judges in judiciary. Uh, we don't satisfy it with the uh, situation that we are doing a lot. We have uh, a specific number of cases to solve per month. That means we don't have enough time doing after out of the court uh, to raising awareness, uh, for example, in gender issues. I think th those what I mentioned is um, very important for female judges. And I think that we share uh, problems in Bosnia and Herzegovina with the other countries. And um, I can say that we have similar problems. And I'm very glad that you organized this conference and that you focus uh, those topics and uh, give us the chance to say something uh, from our experience. Thank you. Thank you so much, Judge Zahiragic. I would now like to turn to our last panelist, Judge Okoye from, from Nigeria. Uh, Judge Okoye, could you share with us a little bit about your personal story and if you have faced any gender-related obstacles along your professional journey as a judge? And based on your experiences, do you have any recommendations to other women judges who find themselves in similar situations? Over to you, Judge Okoye. Thank you so much, Tashiana. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you very well. OK, thank you so, so much for having me. I'd want to thank the organizers of this program for having me. Um, it's really a great one. It's great to be here. OK, yes. Um, I my story 
is a very peculiar one because um, I think I could date it slightly way back to my early days as a female lawyer and a physically challenged one at that, you know? I remember one of those days I came out of court. I had just finished um, my proceedings for the day and um, I stepped out and coincidentally, I was up against a senior advocate, you know, a very senior one at that. I was barely two years. And then I stepped out of court and he met up with me and he said, you're not scared. <laughs> I found that strange. You know, for a moment I stood there, I was wondering why I should be scared. You know, it was much later into my practice that I realized that a whole lot of female lawyers have actually faced that kind of gut puncturing situations. And it has led them to cow away, you know, shy away. I, I just kept wondering why I needed to be scared because I'm a woman. Sometimes I keep wondering if being a woman actually is some form, a form, some um, sort of disability. You know, uh, the, the fact that I'm a woman detract from the person that I am, you know? And so I think that experience actually equipped me moving forward. And so by the time I, I got to the bench, I had made up my mind that um, I was just a woman and nothing more. I wasn't, I wasn't a threat. I wasn't um, any lower than a human being. I'm just a woman. And so I took that to the bench when I went there. And, um, and I tell my colleagues, just like I tell myself every day, all I need to do is to make sure that I'm in charge of my court, in charge of what goes on in the court. And so most times when people enter the courtrooms and the average man out there, including the lawyers. The, law, the lawyers are not insulated from chauvinism. Sorry, the word might be too hard, but the lawyers are not insulated. So once they enter the courtroom and they see you and they see me, their first reaction is always this woman, you know? And they're already, you know, it's more like <laughs> they're, they're ready for a fight or something. It's, it's always there, it's always in the air, you know, stuff like that. So I have always had this notion, this, you know, growing up and being the first, actually, I'm the very first female um, um, physically challenged person to be sworn in as a senior magistrate in Anambra State, you know. So, and I know it is because I have decided to separate and distinguish myself, you know, with the aid of lots of mentors, like the, our former chief judge, the former chief judge of Anambra State was a female, for the very first time we had a female chief judge, you know, she was the one that recommended and appointed me and all that. And she, you know, she always used to say something. She said, the fact being a female, it's not a form of disability, it's not any form of disability. So you have to live above. You have to show that there is more to you and make people understand that, you know? So I think um, my story is quite peculiar and quite unique in the sense that um, not just about being female and on the bench, but um, like I said before, being female on the bench and then being physically challenged and being able to meet up with your daily expectations of dispensing justice. Thank you, Tashana. Thank you, Judge Okoye, for, for so openly sharing your, your personal story. I'm, I'm sure it's in, enriching not just to me, but, but to, to everybody here today with us. And one more question, uh, maybe very briefly, how do gender equality, gender responsiveness, diversity and inclusion, in your view, contribute to the quality of justice? And what should judiciaries do to promote these principles? Okay, um, thank you once again, Tatiana. Um, the judiciary is actually the last hope of the common man. And so if for any reason, the judiciary is perceived to be discriminatory in nature, people are actually going to lose trust. And so when there's inclusiveness, there's gender equality in the judiciary, it actually 
it actually makes the common man have more faith in the judiciary more you know if they 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 would approach it makes it easier for them to approach the judiciary expecting to get justice because it is balanced you can imagine where a female enters probably a sexually abused person enters the courtroom and he has to and she's just been abused by a man and then she comes into an all male you know judiciary I don't think if I'm the one, I don't think I'll be, I'll be, I'll be comfortable relating my ordeal to the person. You know, it mustn't necessarily be a female judge, you know, sit presiding over such cases, but it balances it. It gives it a human face when there's equal gender representation and inclusiveness in the judiciary. And you find that, that the quality of justice, the quality of, um, of decisions you know, made by women, as far as I'm concerned, it's all round because it, it actually, women come in with, um, with um, they approach the decisions, they approach justice with their life experiences as women, you know, thrown at them by social impactations and cultural impactations. They bring all that to the table in their decisions and, uh, and you know, the decisions they make in their in their cases and all that. So you find out that most times when there is inclusiveness, it makes for transparency. It makes people want to, it makes people believe in the system more. And the women actually, to a very large extent, spice up justice with a, bit, a little bit of empathy. You know, they bring empathy to the whole thing and, you know, take away the normal legal thing and bring a, a little bit of empathy to it, the human face to it, you know. Thank you. And then with regards to um, recommendations moving forward, I think already we're doing well here in Nigeria. The female representation of uh, on the bench is actually okay, but I don't think we've gotten there. We've not gotten there at all. There's still this, um, there's still this, um, the um, more of the males there, you know, more of the males rep um, representations there than the females, but then we're getting there. I think um, policies should be put in place. And then with regards to the females that are already there, you know, there should be, uh, there should be programs, there should be um, conferences to further, you know, to further equip them to face the challenges. It's not easy to actually sit out there, sit, especially when you are, when the courtroom is filled up with meals and you're the one sitting out there. It takes more than just sitting there to be able to preside over them. So conferences and, you know, seminars to encourage them, to remind them that they are more, they, that they, they, they are more than enough to do the work. We also, Make way for better judiciary. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Okoye. And what I'm hearing from all the panelists is how vital it is to continue to empower women judges so that uh, gender parity in the judiciary can not only be achieved, but achieved at all levels and, and in all countries. Uh, as many of you might know, the Global Judicial Integrity Network has been working extensively uh, on this topic and you are all most welcome to visit our website uh, to learn more uh, or and access numerous resources that we have developed. But we are not the, the only platform uh, working on the topic and this brings us to the second part of this webinar at, and there are many other important initiatives and organizations active in this field. And we would like to use the occasion of today's webinar to promote their work and encourage all of you participating to find ways in which you could join the cause and be actively involved in the global efforts to, to promote gender equality in the judiciary. So I'm very pleased to welcome uh, our partners in this online event. And I would like to turn first to Sarah Kernegy, uh, Director of Legal Projects at the International Bar Association. Thank you, Sarah, for being here with us and over to you. 
Thank you very much. Um, most grateful to the UNODC and the Global Judicial Integrity Network, and of course to you, Tatiana, for inviting the International Bar Association to be uh, part of this day and to participate with a very brief overview of a core project that we are leading at the moment alongside the LexisNexis Rule of Law Foundation. Um, my name is Sarah Carnegie and I'm the legal director of the International Bar Association, uh, myself also having served as a judge for seven years on the England and Wales Bar T Disciplinary Tribunal. Uh, so feel very passionately about the role of women uh, across all public sector, private sector, in-house sector and judicial areas of the legal profession. Um, it's it's fantastic that there is a now an international uh, day of women judges. Uh, we have been very active on International Women's Day and uh, we've seen the number of female lawyers growing. Um, but I wanted to draw your attention today to the 5050 by 2030 project that we launched in March on the International Women's Day of March 2021, uh, which is led by our current president of the International Bar Association, Almadena Arpon de Mendeville, who is the first female president in 20 years of our association. Uh, the project is looking at the representation of women in the most senior roles of the legal profession across 16 countries over the course of nine years and ends in 2030, hence the title. We have so far covered England and Wales, Uganda, Nigeria, Spain, and we are currently working on Chile, the United Arab Emirates, the Netherlands, and of course the United States in conjunction with the National Association of Women Lawyers. We have been looking at the representation and seniority of women in the judicial sphere, in the private practice area, in in-house com um, commercial business, and finally in the public sector, so working in government legal roles and within prosecution agencies. Just because of time being short today, um, I would highlight at this point that our figures in respect of the seniority of female judges across jurisdictions showed some curious uh, uh, results. We see in England and Wales, for example, only one woman out of the 12 Supreme Court justices. We see in Uganda, six women out of the 10, uh, 10 justices sitting in the Supreme Court. We see in Spain, 23%, 16 women, out of the 69 judges serving in the Supreme Court. Um, and in Nigeria, there are 13, um, sorry, 21 justices, uh, currently 13 sitting, and out of those 13, four female uh, in the most senior court. However, in the, in the Court of Appeal, the current president of the Court of Appeal is a woman, um, but out of the 80 judges in the Court of Appeal, 25 are female. So you can see this disparity uh, clearly at the most senior levels, and that's mirrored across the other legal sectors, with the exception of the public sector in the jurisdictions that we've studied so far. So I'd end today to encourage people to have a look at our website. I will post the, the link to the project um, and would be grateful to the other jurisdictions as and when we reach them for the participation of their judiciary uh, and their public sector, uh, public sector uh, participants. Um, and end today because we have published something today through the IBA Human Rights Institute expressing concern about the treatment of the Republic of Uganda's Supreme Court justice and concerns about what that means for judicial independence. Notwithstanding gender, it's a matter that we all need to be concerned and mindful about. So I wanted to draw that attention to, to all present on principle 11 of the UN basic principles on the independence of the judiciary. Thank you very much for having me, Tatiana. Uh, it's been a delight and I will post that link now. Thank you so much, Sarah. Next, I would like to turn to Tomas Kvedaras, the project specialist working for the UNDP's Judicial Integrity Network in ASEAN. Tomas, thank you also very much for joining us today and over to you. Thank you very much, Tatiana. And good evening from the UNDP Bangkok Regional Office. Um, it is past uh, 9 p.m. in this part of the world, but I really wanted the event to continue thanks to the fascinating experiences, the ideas and call, calls to action shared today. So thank you very much for organizing this conference and for inviting us to present our work. So my name is Thomas Kvaderes and I support, as Tatiana has mentioned, a regional initiative called the Judicial Integrity Network 
in ASEAN. So this initiative is perhaps um, best described as a sister network to the UNODC's global judicial network um, operating within the geographical scope of ASEAN countries. Um, so how do we contribute to judiciaries in member states and how can we benefit you? Um, regionally, our mandate is to support networking, peer-to-peer -peer exchange and learning in the area of uh, judicial integrity and court excellence. Uh, we organize annual meetings, uh, conduct uh, research and surveys, uh, develop training, e-tools uh, that can help legal institutions and their personnel to improve uh, performance and promote transparency and accountability. Uh, moving on to member states, we work with all levels of courts to identify the areas of improvement and provide technical support in addressing them. So, for example, in Indonesia, we work with the Supreme Court uh, to improve the complaints mechanism with a specific focus, focus on uh, female whistleblowers' needs. In Thailand, by applying the self-assessment tool of, as you might have heard, uh, international framework of court excellence, uh, we are working to improve access to justice for vulnerable groups. In Vietnam, our partners are interested in um, emerging technologies and uh, how they can advance course performance. Regarding gender equality and judicial excellence, uh, we have recently published a study on gender uh, threats to judicial integrity in the ASEAN region. Um, and also two weeks ago, we gathered legal experts to discuss sextortion as a topic that uh, Justice Zahirajic has just mentioned. Um, I will share the link uh, later with uh, both the study and the recording of the discussion. And we are also working with a group of distinguished women judges uh, from the Asia Pacific region to develop strategies and practical activities to advance gender equality uh, in the region's judicial systems. And here I say a sincere thanks to Justice Shirani uh, for her active participation. Uh, we hope to have results and practical results uh, in September. So please sign up for our newsletter and uh, so that you can receive updates and further calls to take action and participate in uh, networks activities. I will share the link in a second. Uh, thank you once again, UNODC, Tatiana, and all the panelists for organizing this important and interesting conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Thomas. Next, I would like to turn to Jarpa Dawuni, the Executive Director of the Institute for African Women in Law. Thank you, Jarpa, for being here with us today and over to you. Thank you, Tatiana. Thank you, UNODC and all partners. Good morning from Washington, D.C. to everyone, wherever in the world you may be. So it's been a delight to celebrate the International Day of Women Judges, the second anniversary, which was made successful through the work of many partners. And I remember the meeting in Doha where Judge Vanessa Rios and others were at the forefront of pushing for this day to become a reality. So I am excited to have also joined women around the world on Wednesday, March 8th at the White House to celebrate the White House or the State Department's International Women of Courage. 11 women drawn from around the world for the remarkable work they are doing towards promoting different rights and especially women's rights. I was particularly excited that among the 11 phenomenal women was a woman judge a former constitutional court judge from the Central, Central African Republic, Professor Danielle Darlan, who is one of the recipients of the award for this year. So what does that tell us? That tells us that the work women judges are doing around the world are being noticed. We know that women have faced, women judges have faced all forms of tribulation. Some have been killed for standing up for justice. But Professor Darlan's award and many other women judges awards do show us that women are important women judges are important and the work the work you are doing is not going unrecognized 
But when we talk about women judges, we are talking about a collective. We know that you all come from different parts of the world, different experiences, and women judges are not all the same. So my role as the researcher and the founder of the Institute for African Women in Law is to ask the other question, who is the woman judge? And I have done that through the research we have conducted. I edited a book that came out in 2018 asking the question, who is the African woman judge? Especially those who serve in international courts. As women judges, your lives are too busy promoting justice, equity, and inclusion in the courtrooms and outside the courtrooms. It is the work of organizations like the Institute for African Women in Law and researchers like myself to highlight who you are as individuals and as a collective and who and what you do. So we have conducted research on women judges and we have just launched four country reports across the continent of Africa, starting off in Nigeria, South Africa, Kenya and Senegal, looking at women judges, their representation, the challenges they face, and most importantly, making recommendations on how we can help address the issues and to move forward gender equity and inclusion in the judiciary. I am also happy to announce that I'm working on another book, my fifth book on women judges, and it is asking women judges to tell their own stories of who they are, where they came from, and where they ended up. So please watch out for that book. I am also happy to announce that at the Institute for African Women in Law, we have engaged in a project we call the African Women Legacy Project. It's a series of interviews conducted with the support, immense support of another woman judge, Justice Anne Claire Williams, retired judge of the Seventh Circuit here in the United States, who has spoken to this phenomenal woman in documenting their life histories as women judges. Lastly, at the Institute for African Women in Law, we are also working with partner organizations, UNODC, UNDP, and other philanthropic organizations to produce a comprehensive data portal where we showcase the representation of women judges and magistrates in courts across Africa. So in a nutshell, we hope that you will join us, you will support the work we do, but most importantly, that we as the Institute for African Women in Law, even though we focus on women in law, um, women judges from Africa, women lawyers, women legal academics, we are also open to collaborating with partners in the other regions of the world. And I'm happy to say that we are also working already with the International Association of Women Judges. So women judges, congratulations on another celebration. Continue to do the work you do and remember if nothing at all, we as researchers and organizations will continue to recognize you, we will continue to amplify the work you do through our research, and we stand by you. Happy Day of International Women Judges. Thank you. Thank you so much, Darpa. And last but not least, I would like to turn to Carolyn Hammer, Rule of Law Advisor in the Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights at OSCE. We are pleased that you are here with us, Carolyn, and over to you. Thank you very much, Tatiana. I would like to thank you and ODC and the Global Judicial Integrity Network in particular for the organization of today's event celebrating the International Day of Women Judges. My name is Carolyn Hammer, and I work as a rule of law advisor at OSCE ODIR. The OSCE Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights is one of the world's principal regional human rights bodies. Based in Warsaw, Poland, we're active throughout Europe, the Caucasus, Central Asia, and North America. The office promotes democratic elections, respect for human rights, tolerance, and non-discrimination, and the rule of law by providing support to the 57 OSCE participating states. Our initiatives to strengthen the rule of law focus on supporting judicial independence and respect for fair trial rights. for trials to be fair and judiciaries to be independent, the justice sector should also reflect the community it serves. We see that justice sectors that better reflect the composition of the public also enjoy a greater level of trust. On the occasion of the International Day of Women Judges, I would like to briefly share just a very few words about ODIR's work on gender and judiciaries. OSCE participating states have made commitments to gender equality in general and to equality and non-discrimination in the justice sector in particular. 
Nevertheless, our own work has confirmed that women are often underrepresented in the justice sectors of OSCE participating states. And as we've heard, even in states where there is gender parity, we can see that obstacles for women's promotion and career advancement persist. On ODIR's website, which I will share the link to in the chat, you will find a range of the resources which we've developed examining the root causes of existing inequalities and providing recommendations for how states can support the advancement of gender equality in the justice sector. These recommendations are focused on gender and diversity in selection, recruitment and retention of justice sector personnel, on sensitization of justice system actors and legal education, and on incorporating gender and minority perspectives into justice sector policies. Our baseline study on this topic is available on the website in six languages, as well as in an easy to read version. On our website, you'll also find links to reports from the work that we've done on the topic of associations of women judges, including good practices for the establishment of such associations. Through our work on this issue, we've seen that associations of women judges can make important contributions to advancing gender equality among justice sector actors. And last but not least, later this year, ODIR will publish a new set of recommendations on judicial independence and accountability developed as a result of a process of review of the 2010 Kiev recommendations. Among other topics, these new recommendations will examine the issue of gender and diversity with respect to the work of judicial self-governing bodies, including judicial councils. I would like to invite any of the participants of today's event to be in contact with me regarding ODIR's work on gender diversity and justice, and in particular, if you think there are ways that we could work together. Thanks once again, and it has been a real pleasure to hear and to learn from everybody present at the webinar today. Thank you, Carolyn. So dear participants, as you can see, we could spend much more time on this topic as there are so many angles and aspects that are important and so many great initiatives are going on. And I'm very happy that we could meet today on the occasion of the second International Day of Women Judges. And please follow the activities of not only the Global Judicial Integrity Network, but also the great work of our partners. With this, we are coming to an end of this online event. On behalf of UNODC, I would like to thank all the excellent speakers today for sharing their valuable insights and experiences. I would also like to thank all the participants who have joined us today. We have seen your lovely comments on the screen, so thank you so much for also actively contributing to this discussion. And if you have a few extra minutes to spare, we would appreciate if you could fill out our short feedback questionnaire on this event, the link to which I just posted into the chat. So once more, thank you again for all the speakers for sharing your thoughts with us today and also for all of you who are listening. I wish you a nice rest of the International Day of Women Judges and we will be in touch uh, in the future for, for next webinars of the network. So thank you so much. This is the end of the event.